I think I can hop in. Yes. Hello, everybody. Good evening and uh, Happy New Year. And thank you for spending this uh, evening with us. Um, this is our first uh, webinar program of this uh, new year. Uh, uh, it is, uh, we are running it in conjunction with the exhibit at Henry Sheldon Museum in Middlebury uh, called uh, Artist uh, uh, in the Archive Community History and Collage. Uh, the exhibit was uh, curated by Rick Cassini Kadur. My name is Eva Garcelon Hart and I'm the archivist at the Sheldon. And uh, we are presenting this program in partnership with Collage uh, Life Online. In addition, I would like to acknowledge that we broadcast it from Dakina, the ancestral homeland of Abenaki peoples, now known as Vermont. Uh, today program is called Collage and Place as Archive. And I'd like to welcome our participating artists. S. Erin Batiste, Aisha Schillingford, Jennifer Evans, and Amy Henny Brown. And of course, our Master of Ceremony, Rick, who is going to run uh, this uh, session today. The program is recorded and uh, will be available on our website uh, in a couple of days. All our previous programs and future programs will also be available on our website. So I hope you can uh, join us uh, and you can, you can see uh, whatever you missed in the past, if you like. Um, if you would like to pose a question, the best way would be to click on Q&A, which is on the bottom to the right of your screen. That will be easier for, uh, for all of us to follow. Mm, couple of announcements. Um, uh, in February, on uh, February 8th, the same time and the same place, we'll have another webinar called Artists in the Archive Beyond Humans. I hope you can join us. And then the last in this particular segment of programming on March 11, this time it's going to be Saturday at two in the afternoon. The reason for a change of time is that the artist will be uh, joining us uh, uh, from Europe, which obviously because of change of time, it's much easier for everybody. And it is going to be called Artists in the Archive, European Collages Perspective on American Archives. I'm very much looking forward to what they are going to say about our uh, collections and, uh, and obviously how they see us, our collections in the state of Vermont, uh, which is so far removed from, uh, uh, from uh, people who will be joining us in March. And last, uh, lastly, I would like to let you know that our exhibit, uh, Artists in the Archive, will be, uh, which was supposed to close in uh, on January 7, we decided, due to popular demand, we decided to extend it so you can see it through the end of the summer uh, of uh, 2023. At the moment, we are closed for uh, our winter uh, break, but when we reopen, I hope that uh, all of you who will be in the area can come and see it. So thank you very much. And I'm turning my uh, microphone to Rick. Well, thank you, Ava. And thank you, Stephanie, and the folks at the Henry Sheldon Museum in Middlebury for uh, welcoming uh, Collage Live Online and uh, for hosting this panel presentation. We are joined today by four fantastic artists, wonderful women I've had the pleasure to work with in the past year to talk about this idea of collage and places archive. My name is Rick cassini Kador. I'm an artist, a writer, and a culture worker. I'm the director of Collage Institute, which uh, our mission is to uh, explore and disseminate ideas about collage and to raise collages standing in the world. Uh, and in doing that, we operate a number of residencies and workshops and artist labs uh, two of which the participants in today's panels have participated in. Again, I uh, do remind you to post questions in the Q&A, uh, but I'm going to start today by talking a little bit first about collage. And my thinking here is that 
collage artists use the printed world as material for their artwork. Now that's not exclusively the case. There's artists that don't use material, uh, printed material, but I, as collage artists, we're pretty good at kind of seeing what's out there on the page and then bringing that into our practice, reconfiguring it and making art with it. Often in doing this, this means that we are gathering materials. And for those collage artists uh, in, in the audience tonight, we all know we're hoarders. Right, we're always kind of constantly gathering this material. And in doing so, we're building something that is akin to an archive, although I don't think it's appropriate to call it an archive. But what, what we share in common with archives is that we have a lot of stuff to work from. <laughs> and I'm gonna pick up on that note in a minute. Um, this idea though of adopting place as archive it's really about thinking beyond the printed page. It's about looking at our communities. It's a look, about looking at the places we visit and seeing those places as a source of material. And so I wanna unpack that a little bit. And I'm gonna do that with an abbreviated, ver abbreviated version of a presentation I gave at the Ladder Library in New, in New Orleans this past November. So let's start with what this idea of an archive is. It's a word that I think is used quite a bit, but in a really, really basic sense, an archive is a collection of documents. And a document is just a record of the past. But that is only one way that information from the past comes to us, right? Uh, we, we tend to think of a document as this, right? This almost illegible, written in cursive kind of journal or letter, right? This is a written, uh, a piece of written material that is very common to find in archives. But when we think about how the past comes to us, it really comes to us in a lot of different ways. One way it comes to us is through storytelling. Here's an engraving of a Turkish meta. The, the metas were um, during the Abbasid, Abbasid dynasty were public storytellers. They sat in the public square. They were hired by uh, uh, the prince or the local rulers to kind of just tell stories. And the stories they told were part folklore. They were part history. Um, but that was a part of society and that's how history comes to us in the stories that we tell one another. Oral history is also how we learn about our families. It's why our grandmother doesn't speak to our great aunt because of that thing that happened in 1972. Like that piece of gossip is oral history. And oral history I think is most intimate to us because we're getting it from another human being. It's close, it's right there. It's also how we kind of learn and exchange information with our neighbors and our coworkers. Um, oral history is what you get when you sit next to an old timer in a bar, when they start talking about how things used to be. Uh, this is August Gross, 1930 painting, Two Women in Conversation. Um, another way we hear about the past is through stuff. And when people visit museums and historical sites, this is often, what they're engaging with. They're engaging with material culture and material culture holds the story of the past, but it often needs to be unpacked, right? Lamps don't talk. Hats don't have a conversation with us. We can't get the information from objects necessarily that um, without a certain amount of training or without a certain amount of knowledge, right? But conventional wisdom says uh, stuff goes to museums, paper goes to archives, and together we have a sen sense of history, right? That's how the past is coming to us. But that's not the only way, right? There are other ways the past comes to us. One is uh, the land. Um, the land is an archive. In the most basic sense, we think of cemeteries, where we're literally kind of putting the record of what's in the ground on top of the ground so we remember what's there. Right, a cemetery could be considered an archive of bodies if we wanted to be grotesque about it. But the land holds the history in other ways from the chemicals that are in the soil that track the history of pollution or how even that land was used over time. And in this uh, example here is uh, an image of a work. Um, it's actually from a GIF, although it's not running as a GIF from Forensic, Architect Forensic Architecture's attempt to identify the slaveries of enslaved people in Plantation Alley in Louisiana. Because in that area, which is now becoming a 
series of industrial plants and chemical factories and petroleum processing in that land is the, is the history of those enslaved people um, because the land holds that, that record. Um, cities, uh, cities hold records, right? The land includes the buildings often have messages from the past. Here from these um, images from the French Quarter in New Orleans, we're reminding uh, what was sold at this site, you know, from the newspapers to the wire coat hangers. We see this in our cities all the time where there is the echo of an old building or an old sign that is there telling us what, what might have happened before. And sometimes that record that is imprinted on our cities or places is very intentional. Here we have the United Fruit Company's former presence in this building embedded into the building itself, right? And and thing is for artists, this is something that we can start seeing and start putting together and start building stories from. And lastly, I'd say the body, the body is a record of the past. Our bodies are a record of who reproduced with who going back time and memorial. Our bodies also tell us how much we ate or how little we ate, uh, how much we moved or how little we moved, what we did for work, what chemicals we were exposed to or what trauma we experienced and so forth. And places are places because they're full of bodies, living, breathing human beings. And these are all the ways that the past is ultimately recorded and coming to us if we're open to it. And so I like to think of these as the vessels of history, the ways that uh, the past is coming to us. What we have to remember, I think what's really important is that the history is not the past. History and the past are not the same thing. That the past is the entirety of the things that happened before this moment, right? At uh, 717 on uh, Eastern time on uh, uh, January 11th, right? The past is everything that happened before. And ultimately it is unknowable in its completeness. It is unchangeable. It is forever permanent. But all we have are these little bits of information from our own memories, which are flawed to these little bits of material culture or information from bodies or information from land or what's in the archive and what's in the record. But ultimately, also, our world is made up of these things, that the places we live and the communities in which we dwell are ultimately sources of this knowledge. And so in thinking about uh, the place as archive, I, was, I stumbled across this quote from literary critic Michael Sheringham, and I want to share it with you. I'm going to read it to you if it's illegible on the screen. Um, I'm going to try to because I've got too many windows open. But one second. So Sheringham writes, many archives combine all sorts of matter, some of it vitally important and a lot of it just stuff, gross repetitive bump. And he's right. Anytime anyone spent time in an archive, it can be overwhelming the number of um, mundane letters that are kind of kept there and particularly without any context or story for them. But he continues, but the other crucial ingredient is the idea of the archive as a process. And I really love this idea, a process, something that takes place by virtue of the activities of compilation, preservation, juxtaposition, accumulation, and so forth. And to me, that starts to sound like collage that the idea that an archive is this process of gathering the things that are in the archive, that a collage is a process of gathering the things that are in the collage, and that that actually um, is the process, is the thing itself, as much as the final uh, artwork itself. And Sheringham continues um, that uh, so forth that actually make archival space, at least potentially active and dynamic. It is the archive as a dynamic process that combines heterogeneous time scales, meaning like you might have something from the 19th century right next to something from the 16th century, right? It's all mixed up. So the, the archive can combine those heterogeneous time scales, scrambles origins and mash up 
elements from different horizons. Again, this sounds a lot like collage. And that is uh, what is exciting to us today. So to think of the city as an archive is to think in terms of dynamic process, restless motion, multiple chronologies, and levels of meaning. Right? And I think there's this wonderful parallel between kind of really strong collage artwork and communities in the city or places themselves. That you've got a brand new building next to an old building, that's a type of collage. There's juxtaposition in that. Um, and here's then the role for us as artists in particular, right? As artists, we have this wonderful magical ability to not just make sense of it all, but to kind of bring um, attention to it, to make it seen, to make it heard, to make it something that um, other people in the community can um, come to understand. In that sense, artists can play the role of the meta, you know, the Turkish storyteller in the public square. And we can help our see our neighbors as communities, as dynamic processes, full of restless motion, um, with multiple chronologies and multiple levels of meaning. And when we do this, when we embrace this work as an artist, this is what I think it means to see place as archive and to in, involve that in our collage work. And before I kind of turn it over to the panelists, I wanna suggest that this, this work is incredibly urgent and timely for us to do now. And, and it, it's best summed up by this quote, Lucy Lippert, who wrote in this fantastic book called The Lure of the Local. Uh, Lippard wrote, most of us live such fragmented lives and have so many mini communities that no one knows us as a whole. The incomplete self longs for the fragments to be brought together. And this can't be done without a context or a place. And I think that's a really important lesson. If you think about how many of us our home life and our work life are separate, although not so much during the pandemic, it seems like. But even our family life and our church life or our knitting circle or our softball league, those are all different parts of us. And they never get to come together in a place where we stand as whole human beings. And I think that ultimately, this is a product. This is a, a not a bug of modern society. It's, it's, it's by design. I think that Late stage capitalism with its endless cycle of labor and consumption benefits from us being fragmented and isolated from our communities. It benefits from us not talking to our neighbors, not being in deep relationship to the places where we live so that we are mobile, right? But to be resilient, to survive um, troubles, to overcome climate change, all of that means being invested in a community and being invested in place and having a strong sense of what that place is about. And that's what artists can do. Artists can help us develop that relationship to place in a deeper, more meaningful, more complex way. And in that sense, that place, it can be a form of liberation from the things in the world that is kind of bouncing in, um, us around. And so, Without having set a too high a bar, I'd like to welcome the four artists who are joining us today, who are each going to liberate us in their own way. Um, is that correct? <laughs> um, and I'd like to start uh, by introducing uh, Amy Henry, Hen Henny Brown, excuse me, um, from uh, Vancouver, British Columbia. And I'm gonna stop my share if I can figure it out. Um, And uh, uh, well, there we go. Amy, hello, welcome. <laughs> Hi, thanks so much, Rick. Um, Amy, I just want to introduce, say a little bit more. Uh, Amy and Jennifer come to us. They were participants in the uh, uh, Collage Artist Residency in Scotland, in Sankar. And so they both encountered that place, uh, first through the folklore, and the stories that were told, but then in person as um, visitors to that place for a week. And they're gonna speak about their experience of that. So with that, Amy, take it away. <laughs> for sure. Um, folks, I'm gonna share some images. So I'm just gonna pop up a share screen. Um, and if I can ask for your patience while we roll into that, that's great. If someone can give me a thumbs up that we can see a main image, awesome. Thank you so much. Um, 
folks, hello. Thank you so much for joining us uh, tonight. I want to say a quick thank you to our organizers from the Collage Institute and the Henry Sheldon Museum. Um, and I also want to give a shout out to my co-panelists. Um, I'm delighted to meet with you virtually. Um, it means so much. Um, and taking into consideration, Rick, what you mentioned about community, um, I think that's something that uh, even though we may be far away, we're, we're finding community here today. Um, so my name is Amy Henny Brown. Um, that is my grandmother's name, Henny. Um, so I'm honoring her today as well. Um, I go by pronouns she and her. Uh, I'm also joining the panel from the traditional unceded lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples, which is also known as Vancouver, British Columbia. Um, so the project that I'm speaking about today, uh, I'm really excited to share with everybody my project, Metaphoric Rocks. Um, now, this was a project that came about through the experience not only of the text that we were offered as part of our participation in the Scotland residency, um, but also through the experience of being in place. Um, so the place that we were located uh, was Sankar, Scotland. Um, and one of the things that I found quite extraordinary about Sankar, to me at least, was that the architecture was everywhere, uh, quite unique, primarily made of brick and stone and stone and stone. Um, as I mentioned, I'm on the west coast of North America. And so for me, a lot of architecture, surely because of the age of where I am um, and sort of the colonial history of this place is that most of our structures are made of timber or wood. And so for me, when walking into a place in the world that was built of and from stone had a sense of permanence and time um, that I don't experience in my day to day. Uh, this really communicated to me an idea of stone and rock um, as, as being a kind of earthbound material, but also that it was everywhere. It was on the earth, it was in the surrounds, it was the buildings, it reached into the sky. Um, one of the things that I do like to share with everybody is I, I sort of dig into some of the elements of my project, uh, Metaphoric Rocks, is that I am actually uh, an archivist. Um, I have a, a previous life before being a university professor and a professional artist as an archivist. Um, and it is a part of my studio practice. It's how I think about things. It's how I think about documents. And one of the things that I wanted to share for me is that archives are very much a gathering of the incidental. Archives reflect the ordinary. They're a way of looking at the very everyday records of our lives. And when I or someone else is working with archival material, we have the opportunity to see through these lenses of a perceived past. And I think it's really important to emphasize, Rick, what you brought up in your uh, introduction as well, is that the idea that an archive is a perfect version or an immutable past is we're really learning to let go of that, which I think is super healthy. Um, archives are what was thought to be important and by whom thought that it was important information to keep. Um, so for me, I think that information is really relevant as a collage artist. Um, I keep the remainders of all of my cutaways, um, and this is evident in how the project uh, Metaphoric Rocks came to be, um, in that I started what I thought was going to be a collage about a specific subject matter, these rocks that were occurring geologically in the space of Scotland. Um, but the project also became about what was left when the rocks were taken away. Um, so as many collage artists do, and again, Rick, you mentioned this, the idea of throwing something away is a little bit verboten. So I keep everything. Um, and initially, I cut what I want. I keep the rest for like a air quotes, just in case moment. Um, and initially, when I was cutting away these stones and rocks from the this particular page in a geology manual is that I, I actually misread the title. I thought it said uh, metaphoric rocks as opposed to metamorphic rocks. And I was in the studio space in, in Scotland that was shared with a bunch of artists. And I actually said out loud, I was like, ha, 
meta metaphoric rocks like this idea of something imaginary and I was asking people if they knew that this was a geological phenomenon and then one of my studio mates who happened to be a little bit more astute than I was like Amy you need to reread the title of your page it's metamorphic rocks um I really enjoy this uh sort of happenstance wordplay it's something that I actually actively pursue in my practice of ways of ways of perceiving um and so this sort of started on a bit of a journey of the 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 back and forth between something being metamorphic and something being metaphoric um so this is one of the the ways that the project began um i was really interested in how I was going to respond to the text. And that's, I think, maybe an elegant way of saying that when I began the residency, I really didn't know. Um, I didn't know how I was going to be working with the, the text that we were provided. Um, and, and for me, I was interested in the idea of responding to the text and maybe moving away from a sense of illustration. Um, I wanted to showcase the kind of slippage of time that I was experiencing between reading the text, which was hundreds of years old, being in a place that held a lot of history, and also being there in the present day in my body now. Um, and I really wanted that experience to be how the work came about, and I wasn't quite sure how that would happen. Um, I started cutting out the rocks with a vague idea of making some small kind of 3D stand-ins for actual stones that I was reading about in the geology text. And this was also about kind of translating what I was seeing everywhere around me into art objects themselves. So one of the things that came about as I was cutting away rocks and kind of preparing this layout to send over to Rick as we were printing out our own collage material um, was that I did a Google. Uh, we had a morning session where the, the collage artists gathered together. We were talking about what the power of doing a Google can bring into your practice. And I was like, what does the world have to say or what does the internet have to say about metamorphic rock as a geological phenomenon? And this is something I try to sort of uh, encourage or nurture in my students as an idea of being perpetually curious. And it turns out that metamorphic rocks actually started out as some other type of rock, but have been substantially changed. And when I looked into this further, the Geological Society of Glasgow says metamorphic rocks are formed through the transformation of pre-existing rocks into a process known as metamorphism, meaning just a change in form. They change from being squashy to hard. They cannot be changed back to their original form. The material itself has changed. And I asked myself in that process, is this not an amazing metaphor for what we do with collage? Taking material, changing it, making it an entirely different entity so that it cannot be thought of in the same way once again. So digging back and forth in the text, working between the cutaways, the layout of the stone pieces, and then realizing the potential of the remainders, um, I did a word search within the text that we were provided, Folklore and Genealogies of Uppermost Nithsdale, and it turns out that there are 45 mentions of stone within the book itself, and then 16 uh, mentions, I believe it's 16 or 14 mentions of rock and sometimes both in the same page. Um, what I found really interesting about this is that uh, I'm really interested in how stone and rock become kind of the support characteristic of not only the landscape that I was experiencing, but also the tales of folklore. Someone was always getting hit by a stone or sitting on a stone or traveling through space and time with a stone, or a witch was turning a stone into a cat. And so for me, I think there was this really amazing moment of seeing the underpinnings of the everyday in the text, similar to how we might think about archives as a record of the everyday and drawing the content of my artwork from that relationship with the mundane. Um, looking back at the remainder that I had in studio, what was left after I cut out the rocks, I was struck by how the printed shadow of the page combined with the cast shadow of the cutaway. And you can see this, uh, the gray area is the cast shadow. Um, and then the printed shadow tends to be a little bit more green. Um, and 
I was interested in the kind of absence and presence, uh, how that was simultaneously presenting itself. And this was honestly just because I had the page lying about, there were things underneath it. But I think it speaks to the power of paying attention to our gut instincts and to look for the peripheral, what might not be obvious. Um, so often, I think when we're trying to finish collage work, we are asking ourselves, uh, what can I add in? How can I make this more? Um, and someone who tends to be a maximalist, this is definitely my tendency as well. Um, but I've also been working hard within my, my work um, and within my studio practice to ask what can be taken away and still have the work survive. And I think um, this project is a testament of that question. Um, so within the Mertz Gallery, we installed our work at the end of our residency session. Um, my studio mates and I did a kind of midnight procession to deliver the works, which will uh, remain as one of my favorite moments of the residency. Uh, I'm excited that I had the opportunity to set up the rocks as a kind of portal, a kind of fairy ring uh, that corresponds to the idea both of metaphor and metamorphosis. Um, and just to close up, I, I want to emphasize that this work could not have happened without being in place. Um, I could have thought about making this work, uh, but I, I sincerely uh, would suggest that the process of making this work, of being in companionship with other collage artists um, and in the site of Sankara Scotland allowed for a kind of transmutation of my own ideas and my own process. Um, so that's what I wanted to share with the group. Um, I'll stop the share and bring everybody back into the collective space. Um, but thanks so much for listening uh, about that project. Thank you, Amy. Um, next, we're going to hear from Jennifer Evans. Thanks, Rick. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you, uh, Amy. You and I did not um, overlap when we were in Sankar, but it's and we have very different projects, certainly. Um, but I would say that we came away with some similar conclusions. So uh, I'm Jennifer Evans. I am from Denver, Colorado. This is where I practice my art. I was a folklore major at University of California, Berkeley. And so folklore is a cultural anthropology. So it's a study of people and their cultures represented by stories, traditions, superstitions, riddles, their clothing, their crafts, uh, and their art. So for a long time, I have incorporated um, the stories and traditions of many different cultures in my art. So. That is what appealed to me when I um, decided to apply for the Sankar um, residency. So after being accepted to the residency, as Amy mentioned, we were asked to read a book called Folklore and Genealogies of Uppermost, Uppermost Nithsdale, which is the area around Sankar. It was written in 1904. Uh, the stories in the book were intimately woven into the telling of the so-called history of the area. I'm not sure you can take a story and decide which part of it is history and which part was folklore. Um, and I was particularly intrigued by the stories about witches, which um, who were, by the way, real people, mostly women, um, and many of whom were either burned at the stake or otherwise tortured, uh, as they were in uh, Massachusetts, similar time frame. Um, the stories, many of them were stories about witches who regularly turned into hares, and I'll talk about this piece in just a minute. And um, where you can see some hairs. Uh, the book also talked about the sisterhood of witches and coming from Berkeley in the, I won't tell you exactly which decade, but enough to know that um, I'm a feminist at heart. And so the sisterhood of witches appealed to me. So when we arrived in Sankar, we immersed ourselves in the area and the culture. So I attended the folklore festival that was there. I went fairly deep into a coal mine actually. And I heard the stories, which I would say were both historical and folklore about what happened in the mines. Um, we hiked to the Sankar Castle. Amy had a photo of that, uh, which is quite a decrepit ruin, but you can imagine all the things that happened there and the stories that came out of the castle. Um, we hiked to the Witch's Pool in Croik, and which is, quote, a noted place for witches and appears to have been a sort of headquarters for the sisterhood. It's said that the witches gathered there to plan their deeds of evil and cast their spells. So those things, uh, those stories and those images and those that inspiration inspired my collage. And remember, we were working with materials there um, that were just there, you know, some of us brought some things, but for the most part, we really worked with kind of limited supplies, which was kind of a nice challenge to have. Um, things we found on the streets as well as um, in the box in the studio. So this is my larger piece. It's called The Sisterhood of Witches Transformed into Hairs. 
I printed two large format copies of this photo of the witch's pool. Um, we visited the witch's pool, as I said, and I don't know if you can tell, but I, I printed two, two um, copies and I cut out pieces from one of them and then transposed them or, or glued them onto here. So when you see two logs together, it's really just one log, but I did it kind of as a shadowing, um, if you want to call it that. Um, and it, some people have asked me whether this is digital. It is not. It is 100% analog. So um, it was challenging, but fun to put those, uh, those shadows in, if you will. And, you know, I decided to have, I made these sort of comical versions of hairs or graphic versions and put them, scattered them all around, assuming that the hairs were doing their daily activities, including, as you can see, doing their laundry. Um, we can imagine the, the witches have taken back their power and they're using it in extraordinary ways to make the world a more congenial place as opposed to uh, being burned at the stake. Uh, next slide. So this was just a real quick one that I did. It's called Eating Berries in the Kirkyard. And I think Rick, both Rick and Amy mentioned going to the Kirkyard or churchyard or cemetery at the uh, St. Bride's Church in Sankar. And um, what we did when we were there, we found this, you can see in the lower right-hand corner, we found a berry bush that had the most extraordinary delicious berries. And we figured it was due to the existence of Sankar's most illustrious and fascinating folks being buried there. So this is just sort of a, uh, a feeling of what the place was. And so I tend to be, I, I'm, I'm known as a magpie. In fact, a magpie is my, um, is my sort of logo on most of my artwork. Um, so I find stuff all over the place. My son used to call me a trash picker, which um, is, I guess, the same thing as being a magpie. Um, so I was gathering found objects all around. Um, this is this, these are takeout containers. I've got three pieces that are that I actually put things on to takeout containers. Um, this one is called Parade, you know, Beauty Parade, and um, it's the witches of Croik, uh, disguised as hares. Um, they've taken back their beauty and they can parade around town with their heads held high. Uh, the next one is the Sisterhood of Witches. And again, these are sort of everyday faces of quote unquote rich witches from Scotland. And all of us, or the women anyway, decided that we probably would all have been accused of being witches just because of the things we do and the things we say and the way we act. And this just sort of shows how um, normal women um, were considered witches. Um, and again, it's just taking some of the, the pieces of um, eph ephemera from the area. And then the next one is called have a cuppa while the laundry dies, dries. So again, which is going around their, their sort of daily lives. You know, there's lots of being, tea being drunk in, um, in Scotland, as you can imagine. So those are my tea bags from the days that I was there. And then that's all about doing the laundry. So again, these are takeout containers that I literally found on the street. And then my last slide is one that I just sort of put together at the, at the end. I found a book, old book cover, um, and in Sankar and all the surrounding area there, the slate roofs are quite abundant. So we talked about stones or Amy talked about stones and rocks and so forth. Slate roofs are quite abundant as are the sheep that frolic in the meadows. And so there's some um, sheep's wool and I have put a piece of slate that I found on the ground. And then those are the sheep that were, um, that were abundant in, in Sankar. So, you know, to summarize this, we read the stories of the area prior to arriving. We investigated the area mostly on foot we took photos, we smelled the smells along the paths in the river, we touched the rocks and the trees, we hung out at the pub with the locals to hear their stories and to get to know them. And I looked in the windows of the houses as I walked from my hotel to the Murs Gallery every day and kind of tried to peer into the lives that were there. And I think, you know, take this, when, when artists engage with a place and its stories, and we use the place to inspire our art and bring it to the community, lots of things can happen. The art can help reinforce community ties it may emphasize the pride of the people in their community. I don't know that they all sort of thought about this being a representative of their community. Um, a sense of belonging might be sparked and it may result in community members um, becoming more um, interested and more engaged in their community because of the art that we make. So that's, I think, the influence that we can have as artists when we go someplace and make art and the impact we can have on the community there. So thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. You know, when this exhibit was up in view, <clears throat> on view in, at Murs Gallery, it was interesting because local folks would come in and then they'd start to try to identify 
where a certain fragment in the collage was. Oh, that's the post office, or that's this pub, or I think that's over here. And that was how people were engaging with the artwork. And in that sense, it was a much deeper sense of looking than I think um, what often happens where, what do they say, people spend three seconds in front of a work of art in a museum uh, and rolling through. Uh, before we uh, kind of move on, I want to just share some upcoming uh, events. There is uh, a call to artists for the next two rounds of Collage Artists uh, Residency in Scotland up on Collage Institute's website. And there's also a call to artists for a residency at the uh, Tennessee, excuse me, the Knoxville Museum of Art in Tennessee that really focuses on folklore and particularly the kind of folklore and collage. Uh, and that's going to be in conjunction with the uh, North American debut of Mysterio Mythical Landscapes, uh, Secrets of the Veils. Uh, this is a, a work by another artist, Francis Ryan. Um, but all of this work is interpreting these stories of folklore from Sanker, Scotland. And that's going to open at the Knoxville Museum of Art on March uh, 17th. So with that, um, I would like to thank you, <laughs> uh, Jennifer and Amy. I'd like to welcome S. Aaron and Aisha. And I think we're starting with S. Aaron. Uh, uh, S. Aaron and Aisha both participated in an artist lab we did in November in New Orleans, where we invited artists to come and to make art in response to uh, New Orleans as a city, as an archive of a city. Um, S. Aaron, would you like to go first? Sure. Could you tell us a little bit about your experience there? Um, yes, absolutely. Um, I, as I shared with the, the wonderful group, um, uh, my father's family, Batiste, is one of the original um, Louisiana Creole families. So I did have an ancestral connection, however removed, because my particular branch of the family did the Western migration um, to California and Western states when my grandfather was a, a small child. So at the beginning of the 20th century, so we had lost contact for various reasons. The Creole peoples obviously have complicated racial class histo history um, and relationships even within the families. And so I felt an immediate kinship to the call and also upon arriving in New Orleans. And so we were given um, access to the archives and met virtually as a group um, and also heard from the very illustrious Rick and, and were kind of set a tone um, from the readings from, we had a Sontag reading and we also had a city as archive reading titled after the lab and so I went there um, very actively wanting to engage with the archives. I'm an interdisciplinary poet is how I describe my work and myself in that um, poetry is my primary mode but I also use collage. Um, even within my poetry I write cento which is um, tr loosely translated as patchwork or collage where you make poems completely out of found text. Um, I also have a, a series of erasure, or as I describe my practice, reclamation poems where I'm transforming um, historical documents, advertisements, recipes, also using um, inherited forms to transform poetry. And so my work already it heavily relies on, on history and Americana and archives, but I went there um, wanting to engage in a different way. So the works um, that are being shown now are part of the collaborative effort. And the one on the screen right um, is Rebellion de la Fleur Noir, Rebellion of the Black Flowers, and incorporates um, two different scenes from the flambeau, um, from the his historic flambeau, in the New Orleans parade, um, obviously an older version and versus kind of the newer generation of the flambeau as the centerpiece. There's also um, women waiting for the parade in the purview and in the perimeter. There's also a woman dashing in front of one of the parade floats. And I was looking really for, I mean, first of all, my work centers um, Black women and Black people. And so I was looking for Black people in the archives and I found a lot of the material to be, of course, complicated as 
is America, as is New Orleans, um, as is, you know, this whole thing. And so I found a lot of mug shots and, you know, kind of a lot of people on the worst days of their lives. So I was looking to capture moments of rebellion or rest or care or some type of pageantry or spectacle. Um, and the one on the left, I used um, a book, the, the background, the water is actual from a, a Louisiana book of ships. And then I used um, a model that has vitiligo to kind of represent the mixed race and kind of like the blending of the Creole ancestry um, in a re as, as respectful way as I could, like using that skin symbology to kind of reflect that. And then the statue, is also from a Louisiana book, a New Orleans book, and was a, a statue somewhere in the French Quarter. It didn't indicate exactly where, but that one is reincarnation of the Creole queen. So thinking maybe that she started as an ancient statue and then transformed into this woman and now is transformed into a Creole queen ship, as we see going in the background. Separately, I discovered as my solo project hundreds of Bertillion cards, which was a specific type of mugshot that was created by a French um, man and used in various spaces across America. Um, and so I, I have a divination practice, which in, includes tarot cards and geodes and things of um, kind of occultist or spiritual uh, matter. And so I was thinking about the fact that during this time period, a lot of these, a lot of them were young women and girls. Like I found the average age range to be between 14 to about 25 was the average. And thinking in that time period, photography was new tech and many of them being black persons who were, you know, obviously impoverished or vulnerable. This might've been the only portrait that they were able to sit for in their lifetime. And it was a mugshot. So I was thinking of ways to excavate them and transform them and move them out of that dimension, or at least move the viewer out of that dimension and restore a sense of dignity, a sense of agency and always representation, which was, is what I'm seeking in my work. And also to, to get to make my own kind of history. So this is from part of the, the entire series I'm titling as Major Arcana. And this one is called Luminous and Suspicious Person, number two. Many of them were arrested just for being uh, a dangerous and suspicious person, which could have been just a, a young Black woman standing on the street. Um, so that is part of that major arcana series. And then you can move on, Rick. I also, this is part of the major arcana, but it's also a continuation from a series I started during the pandemic. Um, I started this series, a digital series, Safe Passage, where I was reading a lot of Afrofuturist materials and thinking of where are safe spaces for Black people, just kind of globally, because it seems that they are lacking, and transporting Black people out of this planet and out of this dimension. And so it started as a digital series, so this is kind of a continued thought, but using the archives. So I found some moments where I found Black people in moments of care, this one is titled Cosmic Care, or of rest or of comfort. And you can see they're, they're already in another dimension. They're receiving care, but even their homes have been transported, if just in the archive. Um, and we can move on to the, I believe that's the final. And this is one of the actual major arcana cards. So I'm creating my own tarot. And I'm imbuing that um, you can see the central figure is from one of the Bertillion cards. So I've literally freed her from the mugshot and perpetually, you know, maybe one of the worst days of her life. Who knows? Because her life is unknowable to us. But now she is adorned. She's protected. I've picked um, certain symbology for each card. Some of the cards include... Um, for example, brown moths, which um, are thought to be messages from ancestors. This one has peonies and flowers, and some of the color um, scheme is also um, providing a sense of protection and just a transport, like out of that system and out of whatever life that, you know, that she had. And so 
I've, I've completed 12 works in the couple of months that we've been back from New Orleans, all under this major arcana um, banner and series. And so my experience, it was just, it was a very full and beautiful experience. I think in part being there on the ground and having access to the buildings and thinking about the streets that these women may have walked and these persons may have lived and inhabited, but also being in a very supportive group um, and thinking about going back to our home communities, two of the other participants, including one of the panelists live in my neighborhood. So I was able to go back and think about and work a little bit in community and, and build my own artistic community outside of poetry and writing. And so that was definitely unexpected and like a beautiful surprise. And I'm, you know, I'm grateful to be included. For me, it was my first visual arts workshop. I kind of operate in the world of poetry and literature, but this was a, a way to use archives and to push myself outside of my comfort zone and to see what really opened up. And for me, it's opened up a whole world and, and I mean, really a portal and another dimension in terms of ancestry and, and thinking about history and thinking about um, what archives people hold, even if it's just small moments. Thank you for that, S. Aaron. You know, we do kind of throw, we throw the artists into the pit <laughs> to begin with. <clears throat> I think we walked around for the first day and then the second day we're like, here's three large sculptural forms you all are gonna collaborate on to make collage that expresses um, something about this city or a story about this city. And it was fantastic to watch all of you kind of jump into that. Uh, and those forms are gonna be on view at Collage Fest uh, come June. Um, Aisha, you, um, you had an interesting experience uh, with a taxi driver and I don't want to, I know you have remarks prepared, but I thought I wouldn't know if you wanted to start there because that was a connection to place. <laughs> yeah, I can start there because I don't really have remarks prepared. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I, I kind of feel like my experience with um, the stories of the city <laughs> began before I arrived into the lab proper. Um, as soon as my partner accompanied me on the trip and um, as soon as we got into um, our lift, the driver had a lot of questions and comments about, you know, where we were from. He sort of immediately knew that we weren't from New Orleans for various reasons, including um, our parents and so on. And so I think like right away, like it was a experience of, um, you know, sort of, okay, like you're, you're not from here, not necessarily you don't belong here ever, but like, you're not from here. And, and we got into a rather long conversation, maybe like, I want to say our ride was maybe 45 minutes, um, just about history and, um, ancestry and relationship, dias Black African diasporic relationship. Um, and the driver was sort of, commenting that, you know, in his opinion, people from other parts of the diaspora, from the Caribbean and so on, have a sense of their history, but he felt that he didn't have a sense of his history, having been someone whose family was from New Orleans several generations, and that, you know, when he would ask his grandmother where they were from, um, she sort of said, you know, we're from such and such, uh, you know, housing project, and so on. And so he's sort of been, you um, feeling a sense of disconnection as a result. Um, but because of some of the work we had done in the archives, like before we even arrived, there was this feeling that I, or an awareness that I had of the, of the general history of the Black population of New Orleans in terms of, um, you know, the, you know, uh, state of origin, whether it was um, from the West Coast of Africa via Senegambia, or from Haiti in this sort of second second wave of arrival um, after the Haitian Revolution, and so there was a, a just a moment of you know just curiosity about you know the reasons why someone who was from there might not know um, their history, and and certainly a feeling of conflict uh, about the opportunity we had to dig into history and archive and and visit 
places that are public, but um, you know, just curious about how and whether they are accessible to the people who live there. Um, you know, it's like their stories are in the archives, but they he didn't know even know that. Um, and so that led me to make one of the works that I made um, during the lab was sort of looking at a speculative past. Like most of my work is speculative, usually sort of creating the what I what I think of as maroon societies. So um, spaces where um, people who have absconded with themselves from from enslavement have created these um, sort of places, um, communities of rest and joy and sovereignty and so on. And, uh, you know, my interaction with the Lyft driver led me to sort of specifically look into the archives about whether there were communities like that that had um, been in and around New Orleans and um, found out about such a community. And so the, the work that I made in the lab was so, sort of saying, you know, like, what if this, this community that had originated um, in Senegambia and um, from Haiti um, had persisted through to the present. And maybe this person was from this, this free and sovereign um, society that had a, a clear through line of their lineage. Um, coming back, like I was pr um, processing a lot about what I was bringing back, you know, feeling um, so much connection to the city um, and its many layers. Um, being from the Caribbean, it's easy to see New Orleans as, as a Caribbean city. And many people refer to it as the northernmost Caribbean city. Um, and then other people refer to it as the most African city in America. Um, you know, it, it, I experienced it as a, an extremely layered um, city um, in a way that felt distinct from, from the city that I live in, which maybe feels, um, even though there's sort of, you know, eras and generations, like cities feel a little bit more pulled apart and segregated. I think New Orleans feels very layered, very, or felt for me, very layered, very jumbled, um, you know, and I think part of that is is literally seeing layers on buildings or on streets, like kind of be peeled away and you could see the eras that were there before. Um, so one of the, the things that occurred to me um, or came intuitively was the role of altars in the city um, and how they were situated in, in sometimes the most innocuous places and that how these altars themselves also kind of like bear this like accumulation of like artifacts um, that represent all of these different aspects of the life of the city. So whether it's just the material life or the spiritual life or ancestors and so on. So I wanted to make a few altars that sort of speak to what I noticed and um, experienced um, in New Orleans. Um, so this one, for example, is just sort of you know, looking at the the layers of architecture, which New Orleans is certainly like so iconic. You know, it's it's very iconic to the city, and you know, people. There's I think dispute amongst people. Like we had another Lyft driver that disputed whether some architecture was French, Spanish, or post Haitian. You know, and the fact that some people don't really know, but the archive kind of has an opinion about that, <laughs> um, was really interesting. Um, you know, and then wanted to let, just uh, include the, the people. Um, you know, of, of the city, like there's this feeling I have when I go to certain cities of like, you can feel the the generations of people still around in in how they have shaped and contributed uh, to the city. And New Orleans is such a historical city, has these plaques everywhere. So everywhere you go, you can sort of understand, you know, who contributed, um, you know, and so on. And, and there are also ways to understand who contributed who might not be acknowledged by by plaques, you know, everyday people contributing to the culture and 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 so on. Um, so I wanted to make these three altars that sort of look at the layers generationally, layers in terms of architecture and um, inhabitants and so on. Yeah, and I think I'll I'll pause there. Well, thank you, Aisha. <laughs> We're gonna open it up to questions in a minute. Excuse me. Um, and uh, uh, I'd like to uh, actually ask, I wanted to ask Aaron a question, uh, because you found a very interesting book uh, in New Orleans, a coloring book um, that really surprised you and, and shocked you a little bit. And it was one that I don't think you would have found or come across had you not visited in person. Could you tell that story a little bit? 
Um, yes, we we after hearing uh, Rick's opening uh, lecture and kind of welcoming welcoming us into the lab, um, we went to a Friends of the Library cell, um, which was glorious. It's like a collager's dream or an archivist dream, like of all the things. And so we're looking, you know, for things that are image heavy and behind, like in the in this little crook and cranny. When we were leaving, I find this coloring book. And on the front, it's like plantation coloring book. And so my heart sunk. I mean, I knew you knew at and the, and the outside was like this illustration of a plantation. So then I open the book and I start to read it. And it's written in this very um, sat saturine way of like, what is a plantation? A plantation is a farm. And it had um, at least 25 illustrations of real plantations with their correct historical names, but like these very, it just shocked me to my core because the disc there was such a dissonance between, it was like this one had great windows where people could rest and enjoy the sun. And, or it was just like this one had, and I mean, it was quite disturbing, but my, again, much of my poetry includes America and who gets to be America and who um, gets to have history. And because of my reclamation practice, um, and it was in pristine condition for $2. And so um, I have since scanned it and separate of my collage practice, I intend to um, erase the text or reclaim the text and write my own um, kind of under the inspiration of Kara Walker, who I think works with history in a very complicated way and so it, it was shocking it was also published within a couple of years of my birth which was the 80s so thinking in context when people say oh this was so long ago well slavery was but it was being commercialized and sold as a coloring book that someone from my generation presumably would have colored with if they were born or in that region and so I'm always looking at the ways of like history and who gets to tell a story and often weaponizing text and documents. And in this case, a coloring book, which I never would have thought, but I also have repurposed. I have a series that's based on 1950s skin bleaching and hair straining ads. My mother was born less than a week after Brown versus Board of Education ruled that United States schools segregated. And in the state I was born, the high school um, that she was born, the high school I ultimately graduated from did not desegregate until the year I was born. So 26 years later. Um, so thinking about histories and how it's not that long ago, I'm sitting here on this panel tonight. This is in my lifetime. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, and, and again, I've used quizzes, I've used recipes, a lot of my poems mimic and cloak themselves and transform themselves into other things. So that was another thing that was really, I won't say kismet, but I think it was divine um, part of divination for me to find that work and to know what I wanted to do with it um, beyond like someone else might have thought of it as an artifact or like, oh, this is like the Mamie dolls. It's like cute. Or it, it was written in a way that was meant to be perceived that way. And, and as a descendant, like two generations removed again, not that long ago, it's my grandfather's family. And, and from also admittedly a very complicated, racially complicated and, and class complicated family. My father was white passing, but not all of his siblings were. So there's, you know, there's a lot of deep, as Aisha said, layers, even within my own lineage. So going there, and I think everything happened in very di divine arrangements. Even me discovering the Bertillion cards, like since returning from the lab, I've archived over 118 women now mm -hmm. um, I tend to do something with. Um, and, and maybe that's collage, maybe it's series of poems. It's probably going to transform into many different projects for me and, and under my kind of interdisciplinary practice. But yeah, Plantation Coloring Book, y'all check <laughs> the website. We're going to have a new edition coming soon. Well, thank, thank you for recalling that story. In the, in the question and answer, a number of people are looking to follow up with all of your work. Um, and so they're asking for your Instagram accounts, uh, IDs, uh, website URLs. 
if you could throw them in the chat um, and just make sure you chat to everyone. Um, if, if you wouldn't mind doing that, that would be great. And thank you, Patty, for asking that question. Um, Amy and um, Jennifer, were there things about Scotland that shocked you? Pleasantly or otherwise, like. <laughs> Uh, go ahead, Jennifer, if you if you have yeah, a, I, I don't answer. think there was anything that shocked me. Um, I hadn't been on a on a ours residency before. I've done workshops before. so I would I would classify what we did as sort of half residency, half workshop. Um, i I knew we were doing folklore. I knew we were talking about place. Um, I not sure I knew how much I was going to sort of walk around and just take in all of the stuff that was there. And I didn't know what stuff was gonna be there, you know, whether it was the rocks and stones or whether it was the stories of witches or feeling like witches were there. Um, I haven't made art in response to place. And so doing that intentionally I won't say it was shocking, but it was just a different experience, you know. So um, I don't know. What? What? How about you, Amy? Um, for myself, I think uh, part of the the shock of it was maybe um, I, I'm I'm used to working in uh, kind of feast and famine ways, and that um, I have semesters where I teach, and so sometimes that I just can't achieve studio in the same way that I can when I'm I'm outside of semester um, and I'm learning how to make peace with that. Uh, I will let you know how that lifelong project goes. Um, I think there was for me the shock of kind of being immersed immediately in different place with uh, and I've, I've had this experience before with residencies where you kind of become very fast friends um, with everyone because you're a cohort who's in a new place experiencing something new together. Um, for the first time. And I, I actually really enjoy that kind of relational shock where you kind of, all of a sudden, you know all these things about one another because you're in conversation with, with each other kind of 24 hours a day. Um, I think to, uh, I, I tend to over prepare for situations when I don't know what's going to happen as like a comfort mechanism. And because I chose to travel carry on only, I really had to let go of what I would normally prepare for an experience like this with. Um, so the shock of like going into a space, having none of my like comfort studio items, like I did not bring my good scissors. I could not travel with knives. I had a super ordeal with the security guard, which is maybe the most shocking event of my entire trip where I had to like have a bit of a tete a tete of like, yes, I'm allowed to bring pastels. Um, like just it, like odd things like that where I really had to kind of step outside of my normal working habits that bring me a lot of comfort. Um, and then, and genuinely try to find a way of making work in a very quick turnaround. Uh, and I enjoy that challenge, but it is also somewhat stressful. Um, and that like, you wanna make good work. You don't wanna make bad work. <laughs> so <laughs> I think there's definitely like that for me was something that I really had to had to reckon with. Um, the, the other, like maybe like the, the shock of in a very good way um, was starting mornings. There was a little cafe around the corner from where we stayed that made this unbelievable hot egg sandwich and like a very good coffee. Um, and my mornings are usually really bananas, like just very, very rushed. And to be able to just like sit on a bench in front of a centuries old stone building and have this beautiful egg sandwich and watch the traffic roll through um, was was shocking in a really delightful way. I know one of the challenges for me as an artist when I <clears throat> am encountering a new space, in particular a new place, is getting past that the, the hurdle of um, how do I start to see this place not as a tourist, right? Because there's, the, there's mm -hmm. what you have to do. You have to kind of get it out of your system of go and, and, and do the engage with the tourist view and the tourist lens of a place but then how do you go beyond that and and go deeper and I feel like the four of you kind of did that really quickly and I'm wondering if, if someone has an experience or some thoughts on that they'd like to share um 
Well, I was just going to say, following up on what Amy said, I mean, I felt as though we were living there for a week and obviously we weren't. And obviously we're tourists and visitors and none of the locals would have considered us, you know, sisters or brothers, but it, it, it still by, by sort of doing the investigation we did ahead of time. And then when we got there, just walking all around, I don't know, it felt, it felt like home for a week. Um, and in fact, I think I told you, Rick, you know, my husband and I are going to go back in April because he wants to sort of check out Scotland for whatever reason. But, you know, it, it was very and it wasn't so much that they were the people were welcoming, although they were. But that wasn't the reason. It was more maybe what Amy said, too. And I'm sure you guys experienced this in New Orleans is that, you know, all of a sudden we were a family that was, you know, working together to figure out breakfast, lunch and dinner or to figure out where you're going to walk that day. And so it you just felt more like a resident than a visitor in, in some odd way. How about you in New Orleans? Definitely echo that. Um, I think Rick facilitated a really good group and also just having, um, we did a couple of, of virtual meetups and lectures and things and kind of were able to glean a little bit. But I also just personally, I do a lot of slow travel, so I don't do a lot of the kind of touristy things are like if I'm in Paris, I'm there for a month. So like maybe I spend a day looking at, you know, the Tour Eiffel and like that kind of thing. But I often stay in, you know, a local neighborhood um, wherever I'm going. And even in New Orleans, I did. I very intentionally like stayed in the lower garden district and another of the pan of the participants was you know we were off of the same bus stop so we would kind of see each other getting coffee we kind of both had quiet mornings but then we would take the bus together and kind of chatter and share about like our findings and we also were thrifters you know and the whole thing of like being a collector all the way around. So we had some really special experiences, I feel like, um, as part of collaborating together and working together, but also just really being and building a small, a quick community together. There was a kind of kinship. Everyone's art was very um, strong and they had a strong voice and perspective, but there was kinship and like overlapping interest or overlapping, whether that was just like, like, liking to wear floral prints or sharing similar ancestry or you know various things um several of us we, we called ourselves like the junk eaters crew so we would find like some of the kind of more grease greasy spoon kind of like hole in the wall kind of places for lunch and have like these very messy undignified but fun lunches that also like the act of breaking bread uh, together and eating with someone can create a kind of intimacy and a kind of community and a kind of humanizing beyond like yes we're all here as professional artists yes we're all here to serve our practice but I also see you you know we were sitting on a bench at one point eating like these chicken sandwiches with like hot sauce and you know mayonnaise and we were like oh my god if someone walked by and took a picture they'd be like what is going on but like having those moments, I think really bonded us together and was able to to deepen the collaborative work in ways that maybe if we had been, you know, in an MFA workshop or some kind of more academic or institutional structure, it might have not coalesced in that same way, or especially within that quick of time frame. Yeah, I would just add really quickly, like. Um, I think one thing that maybe distinguished our experience from that of tourists is, is that we, yeah, to, to S. Aaron's point, like we were kind of working, you know, like we had a place to go every day at a certain time to engage in our work. Um, and that kind of routine and the kind of um, accountability and expectation, um, you know, and, and then I think the the second part of it was the critical eye with which we were invited to look at the city so we it sort of disallowed us from kind of you know kind of glossing on the surface and like kind of oohing and eyeing at how pretty it was you know we had questions about why and what you know what really is there and and history and so on that I think you know while we we had a, uh, certainly a beautiful experience like we were we were like learning um and also preparing to do this labor of of making and in some ways representing 
um, back out. So. Well, we're almost at time. There's a lot of clamoring for your um, Instagram uh, accounts and your um, websites. Um, perhaps also in the follow-up to the attend, a follow-up email with the attendees, we can share that that way as well. And um, but I'd like to thank everyone for being part of uh, today's uh, forum. And um, Ellery had uh, Ellery had sharing things in the Q and A. Um, your creative practices uh it's inspiring to see examples of imagining otherwise your creative practices as proposing hopeful futures out of the often painful pasts mm -hmm. um thanks to all of you for sharing your work with us yes thanks to all of you for sharing your work with us it's been um wonderful hearing from you and hearing about your these experiences um and we look forward to kind of continuing to work with you and we look forward to hearing from other folks who have an experience of place and uh, seeing how that informs their work. If you're interested in future collage live programs or collage institute residencies, workshops, things like that, I do encourage you to visit collageinstitute.org and I'll put a link in the uh, chat. And um, But I'm gonna let everyone kind of go uh, for this evening. Uh, we're, we're a little over time maybe, um, but thank you and thank you to the Henry Sheldon Museum for hosting us and um, um, I'm thrilled they're going to extend the Artist in the Archive exhibition uh, and so folks who haven't seen it yet can go visit and see it next year. Well thank you everyone. I think we're going to keep the room open for just a short minute but um, uh, goodbye. <laughs>